My name is Dr. Jörg Hrvanger and I'm a director at MPGU Mechanics. In today's EHGE e-lecture, I will present to you one 40 mechanical model and its many applications. What I will be talking to you about today is first what comprises this ge geomechanical model. You can see on the slide that it contains three items. Firstly, rock properties, secondly, pore pressure, and thirdly, the stress state. These three items are all interrelated as a change in one will affect the others. Thus, they must be treated as one integrated entity. Once you have built and calibrated a geomechanical model containing these three items, uh, you can apply the knowledge of a geomechanical model to questions relating to field development planning. You can summarize it in the following way. Based on the geomechanical model, useful predictions for reservoir development and management can be made. Today, I will firstly be talking about assessing mud weight windows for drilling inclined infill wells. Why would we want to do that? It avoids lost time due to well bore collapse, and it gives you an engineering approach to choosing casing depths. The second application will be to determine risk of fault reactivation due to gas reinjection in an offshore West African deepwater turbidite field. Why do we worry about uh, fault reactivation? Well, fault reactivation consists a seal breach. You can lose uh, hydrocarbons from the reservoir. Uh, in the worst case, you can con contaminate groundwater or hydrocarbons can leak out um, to the sea bottom. The last application I will talk to you about today is to evaluate fracture containment during hydraulic stimulation. The question is, does a fracture stay contained within the reservoir or does it escape the reservoir or connect to two reservoir units? Let me continue by introducing you to the reservoir architecture of the case study I will be using during this presentation. You can see the location of two calibration wells all the way up dip and all the way down dip. Calibration well number one has been um, in the meantime converted to gas reinjector and even further up dip you have a ceiling fault which is the concern for fault reactivation. On the down dip side calibration well number two was the lineation well um, where the upper part of the well uh, penetrates the oil leg and the lower part of the well is drilled into the water leg and it has been converted to a water injector in the meantime. You can see the size of the reservoir it's about 11 kilometers in linear dimension and you can see several reservoir zones um, of sandstone indicated in yellow. If you look in more detail assessing well logs you can see that up dip we have thin sandstone beds, down dip we have two massive sandstone beds separating an upper and a lower reservoir with a net sand thickness of approximately 50 meters. You can see the sandstones uh, by the low gamma ray reading in the left track. You can see a lithological interpretation in the second track in each well log. And then you can see two of the mechanical property, property logs, Young's modulus E and Poisson ratio nu. And what this picture shows quite nicely is you have high Young's modulus in the sandstones and a low Poisson ratio in the sandstones and the reverse case in the shales with a low Young's modulus, high Poisson ratio. This is all quite well known. Um, so this reservoir is like countless others in West Africa, uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico or other turbidite fields around the world. It is always instructional to look at the type location for, for the field under question. So I found a uh, nice outcrop image at, on the website of the Center for Integrated Petroleum Research in Norway, jointly with the University of Aberdeen of, the, of a quarry in northern Spain. You can see the sandstone beds in the slightly lighter shades with a little scale bar of two meters. If you compare that to one of the well logs and an interpretation of the lithological column, you can see that the up dip well, the gas reinjector, has the same reservoir structure with the thin uh, sandstone layers intercalated with the shale beds. The other thing you can learn from this picture is if you look at an erosion profile on the left side against the sky of the outcrop, you 
can see that the sandstone beds protrude slightly further than the shale beds. The shales are softer, they erode easier. That tells you something um, about the mechanical behavior of the shales and the sandstones. So here we have a mechanical property model and showing the mechanical stratigraphy. The next thing uh, we need in the geomechanical model is also the stress state. Uh, you will remember that I talked about these three properties, these three items that comprise a geomechanical model. Here we have the mechanical properties. We also now need to look at the stress state and pore pressure. I'm a physicist by training, so I couldn't resist bringing an equation. So bear with me here. If you see the symbols that were just highlighted, you see the new for Poisson's ratio, you see sigma v for vertical stress, uh, pp for pore pressure, and vertical stress we get by the weight of the overburden, it's determined by the density, the weight uh, of the density integrated over depth, gives you the vertical stress at a specific uh, depth. You multiply that by the new, divide by one minus new term, that contributes to a horizontal stress. Right? So that is the first part, contributing to horizontal stresses. You have a second part, which just appeared on your screen, which is dominated by, Young, Poisson, by Young's modulus E. This goes back to what I said, how mechanical properties, stresses, and pore pressure are all interrelated, where change in one will change all of the others. There's two more parameters, which are called epsilon h min and epsilon h max in this slide. These are tectonic strain terms, which are used in a calibration process. The cal calibration process consists of the following. If I have, for example, image logs and I see uh, breakouts in those image logs and in this particular field we saw all the breakouts being contained in the sandstone. We can use that knowledge to calibrate the stress state such that once we apply the equations we have a, a good certainty that the predicted stress state actually matches the stress state we will encounter downhole. On the left again you have the mechanical stratigraphy and elastic properties. In the central picture I now have the pore pressure and stress state. I first show trend lines of sigma small h and sigma large h, that's minimum horizontal stress and maximum horizontal stress in light blue in the purple colors. And I'm showing the trend lines, you can see um, uh, sigma small h going through all uh, the, the troughs in the sigma h line. And you can see they are quite far apart and sigma h is actually in the sandstones above sigma v, which means according to an Andersonian uh, classification of stress state, a strike slip stress regime in the sandstones. Now if you look at the trend lines within the shales, we can see that sigma h min and sigma h max in the shales are much closer together. How do I know that this stress state is true? Based on the knowledge how borehole breakouts work, based on in a vertical well, based on the difference between sigma h min and sigma h max, that gets magnified by a factor of four um, in the near well bore region. This is the large difference in between sigma h max and sigma h min will cause well bore breakouts. And we will see in a minute that these differences between the three principal stresses here, sigma h min, sigma h max, and sigma v, are also important for well bore stability applications. So this presentation is not about um, calibrating of geomechanical models. That would be the topic of a, of, of a separate uh, presentation, which I hope uh, to, to have in the near future today. I want to continue um, with applications of the geomechanical model, which you uh, see here. Before I do that, I did say we have a 1D calibration model along uh, well trajectories, and then we build a 3D, 4D, and 4D finite element geomechanical model. What I'm showing here is along one of the calibration models, tracks of uh, well logs, and tracks of the of uh, extracted along the same well from the 3D model. What you can see, the point of the slide, is to show that we have a very good agreement uh, between 3D finite element model based on the dots and the 1D uh, velog based model based on the lines. One thing to notice here is if the property model between the velog and the finite element model, the 3D model, doesn't match, towards the top part of the upper sandstone layer, the stress state between finite element model and velog model will also uh, not match. Now what I would say again there's an excellent agreement between the 1D model and the 3D model. So we have 
We are now at the state where I can say with confidence we have a calibrated 3D and 4D finite element geomechanical model. I can now uh, progress to show you some of the applications of this model to field development planning. In the first application, we'll use the 3D geomechanical model that we now have to assess the mud weight windows for drilling inclined wells. This is about wellbore stability and collapse pressure of a wellbore. The application really is how to avoid wellbore collapse when, it, when drilling inclined wells. And I'll use this uh, high-tech uh, wellbore that I um, brought with me to motivate how wellbore instability works. We talked about the 3D stress state where we have a vertical principal stress and the two horizontal principal stresses. Now the idea is if I have this wellbore and I have two horizontal principal stresses, they act to squeeze the wellbore. If, for sake of argument, I'm squeezing I have a large principal stress, sigma h max, in this direction, a large amount of squeezing in this direction, sigma h min in an orthogonal direction, a small amount of squeeze in this direction. You can see that my wellbore is deforming under the application of these stress states. Now, the purpose of drilling mud is to generate a pressure on the inside of the wellbore wall, stabilizing the wellbore wall. So it is the interplay between having the tunnel of the wellbore wall with the stresses acting on the wellbore wall and the pressure stabilizing the wellbore wall. Now, if we do that in a geomechanical model um, with four different wellbore well trajectories, uh, you can anticipate what happens if I drill a wellbore at a certain inclination and a certain azimuth inclination and azimuth. Now, often when we drill exploration wells, we drill them on pore pressure and fracture gradient. Right? You have to have a mud weight that is above pore pressure such that there's no uncontrolled influx of fluids into the wellbore. You have to have a mud weight below, below fracture gradient such that you don't create a fracture in the wellbore wall that can propagate and you lose the drilling mud into the formation. Now, I'm plotting pore pressure and fracture gradient in, uh, in gray and in the light blue, and you can see that they're independent um, of the inclination of the four different wellbore trajectories. There's some mi minute changes, but they are due to a change, a lateral change in the property model. There's one curve, well, there's two curves that change quite a lot. The curve that is most worrisome is the yellow curve in the four plots at the bottom. And you can see that as you incline the wellbore from vertical to nearly horizontal, um, in certain formations, the yellow curve moves way over to the right, meaning that in order to avoid breakouts in the wellbore wall, or in the worst case, a complete collapse of the wellbore, you have to increase the mud weight uh, to such a degree that the mud weight is above the maximum of the yellow curve. So if we apply this idea to the deep water case study, where we had a vertical calibration well, then a step-out gas injection was, was drilled at 70 degrees approaching the reservoir, and as the well was being drilled, a pack-off occurred during pulling uh, the, the drill string out of hole. So what we did in this project to is to investigate the possible root cause of this pack-off or wellbore collapse using the 3D geomechanical model. So along the known wellbore trajectory, we extracted the property model, pore pressure and stress state from the 3D finite element geomechanical model and performed a wellbore stability analysis. And the results of that analysis are shown here. On the left tracks, you can see the stresses along the wellbore in megapascal, um, same, same color convention, gray pore pressure, light blue uh, sigma h min, uh, purple sigma h max and red sigma v. You can also see the top reservoir being annotated. In the right plot, you see the predicted mud weight window together with the mud weight used from the calibration well, which is very close to this new well being drilled. The mud weight of the inclined well that was used for the gas injector was the same as the one used in the calibration well. Look, it worked last time, it'll work this time. We know we drill on pore pressure fracture gradient, 
Yeah. Now, looking at this, at this picture, we already know what's going to happen. I'll show you in the picture anyhow. So during pulling out of hole, the casing got stuck and uh, you see the bottom of the casing that was uh, cut off and the drill bit was lost in hole. Right. Now, there was a good reason why the gas injector was being drilled, of course. Um, so the operator decided to drill a side track and uh, I'm now plotting in the same plot um, the green curve, the mud weight used in the side track and the well was drilled successfully. There were some, uh, some issues drilling uh, th through the seal and you can see why that, that would happen because the green curve intersects the yellow and the morph curves um, slightly. So there would have been breakouts which we, in the valve wall which could be handled uh, by a good hole cleaning practices. There's another way of uh, analyzing uh, valve wall breakouts and valve wall stability. If you look at a particular uh, depth, say in the sandstone, uh, in the shales, that's a picture on the, on the left, um, in a stereo net where vertical valve wall would plot at the center of the circle and then a horizontal well would plot around the outside diameter of the circle and the azimuth gives you the azimuth in which the well bore is being drilled. So you can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the prediction well that we were talking about is being drilled at 70 degrees inclination towards the west. Color coded is the mud weight, the minimum mud weight required to avoid well bore breakouts. And you can see that for the vertical well, there's no breakouts at about 9.6 pounds per gallon mud weight, whereas for the inclined well, you have to raise the mud weight uh, to at least about 10.2, which is the mud weight uh, that was uh, sidetracked being drilled at. If you look at the sandstones, where we had a quite a large anisotropy between sigma h min and sigma h max, um, uh, drilling at different azimuths uh, would happen quite differently, and that is what you can see by the different shades of red and blue at a certain uh, azimuth. So this is what I had to say about well bore instability predictions. Um, we found the root cause um, for the stuck pipe event. Um, and of course, drilling further, side, uh, uh, drilling further infill wells, we can now use the existing 3D geomechanical model to plan for any future infill wells in the field. We, we, we know that it works. The second application I wanted to share with you today is assessment of reactivation risk for an updip fault during gas reinjection at the particular reservoir under investigation. The scientific question can be phrased as fault stability uh, or fault reactivation. And the question of the operator was, what is the maximum allowable pressure at the location of the fault above the initial reservoir conditions? And what we're interested in is if you have a, a fault which is invisible on the left side, you increase the pressure, is there a risk of that fault starting to slip? And that's what the picture on the right side shows. Reactivation of a pre-existing fault poses two major issues. Firstly, there's a risk of leakage of hydrocarbons from the reservoir along the fault plane. And if you have a well bore uh, that transverses uh, such a fault, the fault starts to slip, there's a risk of a failing the well bore, shearing off the well bore. The failure criterion that we use for fault stability analysis is called frictional sliding on a fault. And it says if the magnitude of the shear stress tau exceeds the cohesion S, or cohesion, think of it in terms of stickiness of the material, plus a second term, which is the friction coefficient mu times the normal effective stress sigma n, the fault starts to slip. And this is not so dissimilar from frictional sliding on an inclined plane, which we all have seen in high school. Uh, imagine you walk uh, along a mountain, uh, a mountainside, friction keeps you from sliding down. If you have slippy shoes, your shoes have a low friction coefficient and you will slide down the mountainside. So the, the equation uh, is relatively simple. And I can first will show you how we would compute the required parameters from the knowledge of the stress state sigma h um, min, sigma h max, and sigma v, and the pore pressure onto shear stress and normal effective stress in 2D. And I, I will repeat the same exercise in 3D.
On the left side, you see sigma 1 and sigma 3. Sigma 1 is the vertical stress, sigma 3 is, a, is one of the horizontal stresses. And you can see how a projection of sigma 1 and sigma 3 uh, gives you um, the normal stress, the stress vertical uh, to the plane. And that's simple algebra uh, involving some combination of sigma 1 and sigma 3 and some um, a trigonometric function here, cosine 2 beta. Right? Um, the material properties cohesion uh, we need to know. In intact rock, uh, cohesion ranges somewhere from 5 to 45 megapascal. It, all, it is all, can be correlated against um, other properties. Um, and for faults and fractures, we often assume that there is no cohesion, that the fault planes don't stick together. The friction coefficient uh, ranges in practice somewhere between 0 0.5 and 1 and um, it's a parameter that we actually know very little about what it is exactly for a particular fault, how does it relate to the fault roughness, but how would we assess fault roughness? So what we do in practice is we do a scenario modeling, we use a weak fault with a low friction coefficient and we can look at a standard fault with a slightly higher uh, friction coefficient and then uh, model different scenarios and assess uh, the risk of fault reactivation that way. So we now have all the parameters for assessing fault reactivation in 2D and I'll show you the equations how we would do that. Oh, here, here's the sh shear stress. Um, again, combination of sigma 1, sigma 3 and pore pressure and assign 2 beta. In 3D it is slightly more complex in that we need to understand how the three principal stresses, which might not even have to be aligned with vertical and two horizontal directions, that's what I'm showing here. We have sigma 1, which is tilted slightly away from vertical by about 10 degrees, which also tilts sigma 2 and sigma 3, the two other principal stresses away from the horizontal plane. Now there is the relative um, location, the orientation of sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 to the fault plane um, is what in the end uh, determines the normal stress and the shear stress on that fault plane. So we start out with a stress tensor, the full stress tensor sigma, with the principal values sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3, and the fault plane where we describe the orientation of the fault plane by the fault normal um, n, which is a, a vector with a direction. The first step, we compute the traction vector on the fault plane. Traction vector is a force unit area so it now has a specific direction you can see the combination of the three principal stresses creates a downward force obliquely to the fault plane and that's sim simply a matrix ve vector multiplication to get that traction vector t in the next step we can then compute the component of the traction along the fault nor normal and that gives us the normal effective stress sigma n and we can look at the, uh, well, the normal stress and normal effective stress by subtracting pore pressure. And the shear stress is a projection of the traction vector onto the fault plane. And you can see that the shear stress goes obliquely downwards on the fault plane. On the opposite side of the fault plane it goes obliquely upwards the fault plane. So now we have all the parameters sigma n, tau, S0 and mu in the, in the application of the failure criterion and we can look how this pans out for that case study. You see three images of the same fault plane uh, with interpretations of the uh, rest top and intermediate reservoir horizons indicated by black lines. On each of the fault planes we have uh, color coded the pressure increase above the initial reservoir pressure and shale pressure that would allow this fault to slip. The three pictures differ in the friction coefficient used in the analysis. Um, the left picture uses a very low friction coefficient, which would be a very weak fault. Middle picture uses a weak fault. And uh, the right picture uses a friction coefficient of 0 0.6, which is the standard value, which is uh, taken from the classic paper by Biley in 1978. What you can see, which is quite pleasing, just above the top reservoir uh, horizon is a blue band in each of the three pictures which indicates that um, 
in that blue band, it takes a pressure increase of more than 10 megapascal um, at least to reactivate um, the fault in the seal. Now, uh, based on the, on the field development plan and the gas reinjection, the operator estimated, um, well, the simulation model told us that there is about a thousand psi pressure increase um, uh, maximum at the fault, which is just below seven megapascal. So based on that very strong seal, we are convinced that the, the, the seal integrity is intact. What we would say is that within the reservoir, as you can see in the yellow colors, there's a risk of the fault starting to slip. That could uh, result in micro seismic events, which could actually be recorded um, on micro seismic stations. That was the second application, looking at the pressure increase to fault reactivation. And I have uh, one more application today. Now, I did want to give a bit of a forward-looking uh, uh, statement today. A better way of simulation fault faults would be by using a fault process zone. What you see on the left side is a finite element mesh of the reservoir and the fault zone. In the previous uh, application, I showed you the fault as a, as a plane. If you're a geologist, you understand that most faults consist of a process zone, so they have a volume. And this is what, what we started thinking about in this picture. You include the fault process zone as a geobody into your geological model and into your gridded geomechanical model, which then allows you to trace pressure and fluid fronts in the fault zone. This gives you a more realistic simulation of geometry and the physics of stress and pressure changes in the fault. And this is how a simulation would, uh, would look. So that would be the pressure signal uh, from one injector, which is at the uh, location of the darkest uh, red spot. The pressure front moves through the reservoir. And you can see how the pressure front moves up the fault zone at a slightly different rate than within the reservoir, since there is a, a different permeability uh, assigned to the fault zone. The last application I wanted to share today was fracture containment during hydraulic stimulation. In the specific application I'm talking, uh, field that I'm talking about today, uh, the question was, there's an upper and a lower reservoir, and the stimulation engineer asked the question, look, if I stimulate my wells to increase flow, I know that I want to do that. However, if I do create the hydraulic fracture, I would like to avoid the hydraulic fracture growing through the shale barrier between the lower and the upper reservoir. We want to keep uh, uh, the ability to produce the upper and the lower reservoir separately. Now, the way we went about answering this question is by analyzing the difference in fracture gradient, here defined as the minimum principal stress between caprock and reservoir. The idea is very simply that the minimum principal stress is the single most important parameter that determines fracture propagation. What you can see in the pictures here, uh, sch uh, schematics, where you have the minimum principal stress on the left picture uh, decreases in the reservoir, whereas on the right side, minimum principal stress increases in the reservoir. Left picture, fracture stays contained. Right picture, fracture escapes. Now, if you do this analysis at the location of the per, uh, 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 perforated interval, and you uh, do that analysis of sigma min in, in, the, um, in the shale barrier, you get uh, the following pictures for all the wells in that field. Right? So within the reservoir sandstones, I'm color coding uh, at the location of the perforated interval, uh, the fracture gradient extracted from the 3D geomechanical model. You can see it's mostly uh, light shades of blue and the shades get lighter as you go into, into deeper water. So you can summarize that the fracture gradient decreases with increasing water depth. Water depth is given by the, uh, by the ISO lines um, on, the, on the gray background. Now if you do the same analysis along the well trajectory in the uh, shale barriers, and it's, it's an average along the shale barrier, we get the following picture. So I'll flick back and forth, right? Reservoir, cap rock, the shale barrier, reservoir, yeah. cap rock. You, you can see that in the cap rock, all the dots change their color to a deeper shade of blue, 
meaning there's a higher fracture gradient um, in the cap rock. We can summarize all of these, uh, th th these points in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. I'll do that in the next slide. But the takeaway is that we have a markedly increased fracture gradient in the cap rock compared to the reservoir, which implies that the hydraulic fractures are likely to be contained within the reservoir. The next picture shows the same information in a slightly different form. On the horizontal axis, um, you have for each uh, well, the fracture uh, gradient expressed um, as an equivalent mud weight. On the horizontal axis, in green, you have uh, um, the sandstone fracture gradient uh, predicted at the completion. In red, by the red crosses for the same well, um, you have the fracture gradient within the cap rock. On the vertical axis, you have uh, um, uh, the, the water depth above the completion. So again, you can see the trend lines with the fracture gradient um, uh, decreasing with increasing water depth. All right, so these were um, the three applications that I wanted to share today. So I'll um, summarize what I shared with you today. I showed you a 3D and 4D finite element geomechanical model that was calibrated to 1D mo models. Um, we used a fully coupled flow and geomechanical finite element simulator and we had an excellent match of the horizontal stresses between 3D finite element simulations and the 1D poor elastic estimates calibrated to well bore observations. The real point of the presentation, however, was the applications. So we spent a lot of time building and calibrating 3D and 4D geomechanical models, and that is a lot of work. However, once such a model is built, it is easy and quick to use the stress state, pore pressure and mechanical properties for a range of useful tasks in field development planning. What I showed you today was an application to well bore stability. That was the stuck pipe event. To fault reactivation due to gas reinjection. I showed you how we had a very good uh, pressure seal in the cap rock. And lastly, fracture containment during hydraulic stimulation. There are, of course, a lot of other applications um, of the same model that could be shared. For example, mud weight windows during life of field, uh, prediction of subsidence and compaction, prediction of fracture tortuosity during hydraulic stimulation, uh, using the model for time-lapse seismic feasibility studies, uh, integrating it with observed time-lapse seismic data, looking at valuable integrity, and many more applications. So it is one 4D geomechanical model and its many applications. Before I conclude, I want to acknowledge some of my co-authors, uh, my colleagues Peter Popov and Andy Bottrell at MP Geomechanics, who worked with me on the projects. The 1D geomechanical models were created by Icon Sciences 1D geomechanics team. I want to especially mention Antonio Santagatti, Scott Reynolds, Scotty Mildred, and Jerry Meyer. The pore pressure model used was reviewed by the Icon Science pore pressure team, Alex Edwards and Ed Hoskins. David Gaveth and John Cicciarelli assisted in model building and advised on reservoir engineering uh, processes. And of course, permission to use the slides from a deep water turbidite case study is gratefully um, acknowledged. So I thank you for your attention and I encourage you to uh, check out the other EHE e-lectures. Thank you very much.